Okay, so before we go any further, I just want to point out, we're doing quantum mechanics, and this is what quantum mechanics is. So congratulations, I think we're finally safely there, we can say that. So um, now with that said, you've probably heard that quantum mechanics is tough, and this next lecture, this next video, this next portion lecture is going to nail that down. Like I guarantee this is gonna get messy, so you might wanna grab your goggles. So with that said, I'm gonna do as, as best as I can to lay this out in the most straightforward fashion. Um, so what we're gonna ask now is, given that everything we've just done, we've talked about a quantum operator, and we've said that in the case of the position operator, we're, we're asking a question, what is the position or the most likely position? And as a reminder, we, we analyzed this and we found that if you wanna ask what is the most likely position, you take some, some expression here, psi star, or the, the conjugate, and you sandwich between that and psi just x. So we say formally that the position operator is simply the function x. That's what we have to place inside there. So what I want to ask now is what function do we have to place inside there to give us the most likely momentum? So this is going to be the momentum operator once we find what this sandwichy thing is gonna be. We're gonna take a, the same integral of psi star times some unknown now function times psi dx, and whatever function that we end up placing inside here, that this will be our momentum operator. So I hope that's clear, that we're, we're gonna go through and analyze the hell out of this. We're gonna find some function that goes in there that will give us the answer of what is the most likely momentum of the particle. And like I said, it's gonna get complicated. So there's a couple preliminaries that we need to go over here but I just wanna make very clear what we are trying to solve for because in the end, this thing there is gonna be our momentum operator. So let me get rid of the right-hand side here. All right, so in order to do this, there's gonna be three key equations that we're gonna to need to use here. Um, the first is gonna be just basically defining what is our question here or defining what it means to be momentum in the first place. So. Um, there's, like I said, three kind of key equations that we're going to employ, and I, I guarantee if any of these are, are unfamiliar or confusing, it's not going to be a fun time here. So just make very sure that you understand each of these three things or, or where we're going to pull them from when we need to here. So first off, classically, we know that we define momentum as simply mv or let's be a little more clear, that's m times dx dt for one, one dimension. Now here's the issue. Classically speaking, we can, we can say exactly where a particle is. We can say, hey, you're at a position of x equals 0.95555 meters or something like that. The problem with quantum mechanics is that we can no longer definitively say where something is. The best we can say is there is a probability of being a certain place. And when we talk about this thing here, the expected value of position, we're saying the, the most likelihood, the, the, where the probability distribution has its peak, or at least where it's centered about if it doesn't necessarily peak there. So we can't say how quickly does that position change anymore. The best we can say when trying to look at this term here is talking about how quickly does that most likely position change. So the way that we're going to define momentum now is not the actual translational momentum, but it's how quickly does that expected position change times m, of course. So quantum, quantum mechanically, So quantumly, but that's not actually a word. So quantum mechanically, the best we can do in talking about the momentum is say is saying that 
the expected value of momentum is whatever the mass is times how quickly the expected position of the particle changes. So again, since this is inherently a probabilistic description now, we can only talk about the most likely of a range of possibilities. So this, again, like, like this shouldn't feel right to you. And this is why, like, even still today, you know, 20 years after learning this, like, I still don't like this, but like, literally, this is correct. This is the only way that we can talk about it. So, so let's go ahead and, and so this is our kind of key number one, and just kind of keep this in your mind that the way we're going to analyze this now is we have this expression for the expected position. And we're going to basically multiply it by m and take the time derivative. So we'll come back to that in a moment. That's how we're going to try to find this thing here, which is that. So, so pause it right here and review everything we've just done if, if our question doesn't make sense yet, because this is how we're going to do it. So in doing so, the, the next most important equation that we're going to use is the Schrodinger equation. And so um, pause it again and try to, try to write out from memory what the Schrodinger equation is. Uh, this is something that like every time I write the Schrodinger equation, try to like make you, force yourself to like write it out by memory because you absolutely have to memorize this if you are a quantum physicist or if you are any type of a physicist. So it looks like IH bar d psi dt. Now I'm just, I'm, I'm omitting the x's and the t's as a function of, uh, that are, that psi is a function of, equals minus h bar squared over 2m d squared psi over dx squared plus v psi. Now, we haven't really talked about everything that this means here. Now, one of the things we're going to do today, once we can identify what that momentum operator is, and, and by the way, again, these should be somewhat confusing sounding terms, but I guarantee when you go back and watch this again later, it will make more sense. But once we're able to define what that momentum operator is, we can then rewrite this equation in a much simpler fashion. So that's why I've intentionally avoided trying to like interpret what this means yet. So we're going to use this equation. And the form of this equation we're going to use is slightly different. I just want to get this thing by itself. So I want to remove the i and the h bar from the left hand side. Now, one of the ways that you can do it is just divide both sides by i h bar. But here's a trick when you're, when you're using imaginary numbers, if you want to get rid of an i there, you just multiply everything by minus i. So I'm going to multiply both sides by minus i over h bar. And by the way, re remember why that works out. I times minus I equals one because I squared itself is minus one. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply both sides out by minus I over H bar. So we get out D psi DT equals. Now we're going to put a minus I on top and then H bar is going to be reduced by one factor over two M d squared psi over dx squared. And then it doesn't matter what v is here, because in the end, I promise it's going to go away. But we do have to keep that around, plus uh, I need my, my i and h bar. Uh, so I have a minus i over h bar v psi. Now, again, that last term, it's, it's unimportant for now. We will come back to that because it's vitally important for later. But this is the form of the equation that we're going to pull out here. And so I'm just going to go ahead and label this uh, with red. I'm going to label this equation A. And I'm also going to take the complex conjugate of everything. And remember, I described this a little bit earlier, but simply if you have an, a, an equation that has imaginary terms, if there's an i at any point, you just flip i to minus i. Or if there's a minus i, you just turn it to plus i. Now remember, our, our function psi itself is not only likely to be, but it, it must be at least complex, partly imaginary. So the complex conjugate, I'm going to write this as equation a star. 
And remember, whenever we see a star now, that indicates to us that it is the conjugate of that. So equation A star will simply look like this. D psi star dt equals plus ih bar over 2m d squared psi star over dx squared plus i over h bar v psi star. So again, I've simply flipped the sign of each indication of i, and I have turned the psi into psi star everywhere. Um, and in looking at this here, let's see, I realize that I have screwed up already. Uh, and by the way, this is going to be the first of numerous screw-ups here. So in going from this line to this, I actually, I, I needed to, when I multiplied this by negative i, I, I shouldn't have a minus there, and I should have a minus there. Um, and let me confirm that's correct. Yes. Okay. Yep, sorry about that. So anyway, the only, the only difference is that this should go from negative to positive, and then we insert that negative back when we flip everything. Um, this should be correct. So, so I, I would encourage you, like, maybe just on one side of your notes or, or in, even in, like, the, you know, colored letters like this, because we are going to come back and we are going to use each of these at different, well, actually at a similar point, both of them. Um, there is a third thing that we're going to use, and it has to do with a mathematical integration property, which I'm going to erase the board here, and I want to review what integration, not, not integration by parts, what integration by parts is. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> Okay, so like I said earlier, um, one of the things that physicists try really hard to do is to not integrate things we don't have to, and one of the best ways to do that is to identify when you can use integration by parts. And um, honestly, this is, it, it's, it's one of the most important things to not only know how to do, but especially importantly to recognize when you should do it. And again, like, I, I don't know how many, not hours, but even like days, I have wasted in my life by doing like graduate law problem sets when I could just say integration by parts, next step. So, just as a quick reminder, whenever you have something that looks like this, think to yourself, can I integrate by parts? And the thing should look like this, from integral from a to b of some function f times the derivative of some other function g with respect to whatever our integration variable is there. So, it's like, obviously, on like a math exam, it's easy when you see exactly what f is, you see exactly what g is, but it's more difficult many times to recognize, oh, hey, there's some complicated looking thing that's actually just some derivative of a simpler thing. So we will see that here as we go along, but remember, if this is what you have, you can integrate by parts and turn that into the following. You flip the derivative and flip the sign, so it equals minus the integral, same boundaries, of df, d, no, not g, df dx times just g itself. <laughs> All right, try number three. df dx times g, and still the same variable. And then to that, you have to add the function g times f, or it can be either order, you usually see it flipped, I just did that wrong, from a to b. So this is what we call the surface term. Now, what, what we're gonna find for, for the vast majority of when we employ this in quantum mechanics, this surface term will almost always go away. And I'll explain that when we get to it, but the nice thing is though, when you can do integration by parts, that once you can, basically what you want to do is be able to flip those two, the, the functions to take the derivative of the other, and then typically if you can argue, you know, in, in your head, why you can remove that surface term, you just stop worrying about that. So if you can ignore the surface term, this thing here just turns into this thing there, ignoring that part. And I will call this, well, I don't need to call it anything. It's, it's integration by parts. Again, there's no need for quotes there. 
Um, okay, so with, with this primary setup here, understanding what the hell we're doing, understanding the Schrodinger equation written slightly differently and then conjugated, and then reminding ourselves what integration by parts looks like, this is where the fun begins. So hold on to your seats because this is gonna be a super important result and getting there is gonna be a great exercise in how to actually do quantum mechanics for real. But like I said, this is not gonna be simple. It's not gonna be straightforward. So I really encourage you to go through methodically and slowly as I work through this, pause it like 18 times to see why I've gotten where I've gotten and work it out for yourself. All right, ready for it?